How's it going? Adam Drake here, and today I'm going to take you through the build process for the new Mugen MBX-8R Eco electric buggy. I'm going to go over just kind of all the steps of how the kit uh, is built, um, kind of the stock settings. I'll also talk a little bit about some of the option parts that I use on my personal MBX-8R Eco, and also some little tips and tricks along the way. So hopefully you enjoy. We'll change the camera angle and allow you to take a closer look and we will start the build process on the new MBX-8R Eco. Okay, so here we have bag A for the MBX-8R Eco buggy. A um, Couple things that are different from the Nitro car is the Eco comes with a molded or plastic spur gear. It also has the 4313 option for the ring gear. Uh, is 44 and then the pinion gear will be a 13 tooth on the electric car. This is going to give a little bit smoother delivery of the power and a little bit more uh, overall top end. So we choose that option for the electric car and then on the nitro car we use the 1242. Um, I'm also going to use Mugen makes uh, actually a bunch of different sizes of shims but these are the um, shims that I'm going to use before installing the bearings for the front and rear diff. This just makes it a lot easier when you install the diffs. You don't have um, the shims that you're trying to line up and um, sometimes will bend. So for both nitro and electric buggy, I use a 0.2 millimeter shim on each side. So on the ring gear side and also on the cup side for the center diff you don't need to use any shim so you'll slide that on before installing the bearings and once the diff is finished once it's all put together and you go to put it into the gearbox it's just a lot easier to basically press the diff in and not have to worry about aligning the uh, the larger um, stock shim so I'm going to go ahead and just kind of prepare the rest of the parts here and start to assemble um, all three of these differentials. It's really, really important that you use grease on the outdrive cups. You can see here on the outdrive there's a, a small groove. This is to hold grease and then I also put grease on um, where the outdrive goes into the diff cup and also into the ring gear. Um, it's just really important, especially over time. Um, it helps seal to make sure that the diffs don't leak and then um, makes it to where the outdrive doesn't kind of get bound up in the cup. So I'm just gonna go ahead and apply a bit of grease all of the outdrives and then we'll do the cups and the gears. You can also put a little bit of grease on the o-rings if you want or even use an actual o-ring grease um, but if you apply a fair amount to the outdrive and then also the cup and gear you don't really need to put any additional grease onto the O-rings. Just make sure you kind of spread that grease around so that you have a nice even coat before you start to assemble the diffs. So um, I believe in the kit the stock diff setting is 552. I normally run 10, 10, 7 in my diffs. Um, if you're on a lower grip track, you may want to go with like 7, 7, 5. Um, for Rhonda, she always prefers a little bit heavier rear diff just to allow the car to be smooth and the rear end to not step out mid corner and also have the drive on exit. So maybe even like a 7, 5, 7, but it, it really depends on the conditions that you're you're driving in so but again for me I usually use 10 10 7 in my diffs 
So other than that, everything with the diffs is going to go together pretty straightforward. Um, you know, pretty much as the manual would would show you. Um, I do like to take a Sharpie and I'll just mark on the ring gear or you can even mark on the cup what the diff fluid is. That way, um, if, if you, you know, go a little while in between, um, you know, servicing or maintaining your diffs, you don't forget what's in the diffs or if you're at a race and you make a change, um, it's just always nice to, to have some type of record and reference to go back to um, for your diffs. Um, with the MBX-8R Eco, we did change the um, larger sun gears inside the diffs, uh, just like we did on the nitro car. So you can see here, there's just one dot on these gears. So with the original MBX-8, there was a dot here and a dot here. So two dots on the sun gear. Now with the new gears, there's just a single dot. That's just, uh, just for reference, just so you can tell between the standard gears and the R gears. And with the R gears, it looks very similar. And, and you're gonna, some people are gonna say, oh, the gears didn't change. Well, they did. Um, it is a very small change, but what we changed allows the mesh to be freed up uh, with, with the diffs. So when it's assembled, you now can assemble the diffs using all of the shims. So you'll use two of the larger shims uh, that go behind the sun gears and then four of the smaller shims that go behind the four smaller gears um, inside the diff. So you're gonna wanna use all of the shims just like what the manual says. Um, it was a little more confusing in the past with the original eight, we were moving some shims or taking some shims out depending on how the diffs felt, but with the 8R, we actually use all of the shims. So I'm gonna go ahead and just finish assembling the diffs, put the fluid in, build them, just because there's not really a whole lot else to, to kind of talk about with this, and then we'll move on to the next step. So I went ahead and installed um, the diff fluid. Well, first I poured diff fluid into the diff cup, installed the gears and the washers. Now I'm gonna go ahead and just wipe off any of the excess fluid. So you wanna go ahead and fill the diff all the way to the top, wipe your finger across, and then just take out the little bit of excess um, where the out drive is gonna go when we put the diff back together. And we'll do the center diff. And then from there, I'm gonna go ahead and just put the, put the diffs together here. Now you'll wanna make sure to line up um, make sure that the gasket um, is in line with the gear so that otherwise what happens when you rotate the gear, sometimes the gasket um, won't line up. So I'm going to go ahead and just put all these together. And then from there we will go ahead and put all the screws in and move on to bag B. So we'll go ahead and do that real quick and finish up the three diffs. All right, so all three diffs are together. I marked with a Sharpie 7, 10, 10. So seven for the rear, 
10 for the front and 10 for the center. Now, these two shims are the 0.2 shims that I was talking about uh, that you don't need anymore. So normally these slide over the diff. When you go to put the diff into the gearbox, it can be a bit of a pain. So that's why we used those shims that went on before um, installing the bearings. So bag A is done. Moving on now to bag B, which is going to be the front gearbox assembly. So pretty simple, straightforward. We're going to go ahead and install the 6x13x5 by by bearings. I already went ahead and cleaned the uh, center drive coupler and also the set screw uh, for that. So we're gonna go ahead and install, or I'm sorry, apply some thread lock to the set screw. And then what I like to do is I'll actually run the set screw all the way in, back it out, kind of work it back and forth a couple times just to make sure that the threads inside the coupler um, have like a nice even coat of thread lock. And then we'll go ahead and put the center front out drive onto the cup, run that set screw down, and then I'll wipe off any excess thread lock. And then you'll go ahead and crank this down. Now with the Mugen vehicles, you can push the pinion all the way on tight to the pinion and then there'll still be just a tiny bit of backlash. So it's the way that this is machined um, is so that you can't really crush or pinch the bearings. Then we can go ahead and drop the front diff in. And that should snap in, should be nice and free. Install the front cover. Now, something that a lot of times people are a little bit concerned with is when they put the front gearbox or the rear gearbox together, they'll notice that when they have just this front cover on, when you flip it over, there'll be quite a bit of backlash. So it's going to seem like the ring and pinion mesh is way too loose. Well, it's going to seem loose until you screw in the 4x20 screws that go through the chassis and then pull this front cover down. So once that front cover is pulled down, it's going to tighten up the mesh. So if you have it to this stage and you check the mesh and it feels a little bit loose, that's normal. Um, if you used the 0.2 millimeter shim on the gear side and also a 0.2 millimeter shim on the cup side for buggy, whether you're using the 1344 or 1242, the mesh should be fine. Now, over time, like if you if you put, you know, a couple months worth of running, you may need to adjust that shimming. But when everything is new, a 0.2 on on both sides is going to make the mesh uh, pretty much perfect. So now we'll go ahead, put the A block on, and then we'll put the front shock tower on. Front shock tower is new for the MBX-8R Eco. So with the front tower now, we have a more adjustable upper front arm length. Um, the, the stock setting is going to be the middle middle pills, um, but these pills are now square so it allows just a, a bigger range of adjustment. You can now move the upper front arms up and down and also make it shorter or longer. Now, one tip that I like to do, especially for the rear shock tower, but you can also do it on the front, is 
for these lower two holes that secure the tower um, to the gearbox. You can actually run a longer screw and then put a nut on the back side just to make it um, a little bit more durable. The front uh, shock location on the tower is going to be middle. A lot of times we lean the shocks in one hole from center, but for this build, uh, since we're building it just to the manual, uh, for the most part, we're going to go with the middle position. And I like to put a little bit of thread lock on the screws before tightening down the, uh, these shock screws. And then there you have bag A and B are now complete, and we will move on next to bag C. So here we have bag C, which is going to be um, front lower arm assembly. Uh, with the droop screws and um, sway bar mounts that go onto the arm. Uh, so again, pretty straightforward, pretty simple. Just if you've built any other Mugen car, it's going to be um, pretty simple. Simple steps for bag C. Uh, a couple things though to point out is with the front arms that I'm assembling right now, it comes stock with these plastic plates. We also offer optional one mil carbon fiber plates and 1.2 millimeter carbon fiber plates and also um, a stiffer lightweight front arm. We also offer those same options for the rear arms. I prefer the lightweight arms um, if you're looking for just every bit of performance, that's going to be what you want to go with. The standard arms are going to be a little bit more durable because um, they, again, they're a little bit softer material. Um, one thing though that I do like to do with the front arms is even if you trim the arms off the tree with flush cutters, I like to go with a Dremel. and just really quick trim, make sure that there's no flashing on the inside. So we'll just do that with both of the front arms. You can also use a file, um, but it just makes it, makes it easy with, with a Dremel. And then I don't do any drilling or reaming to the inner hinge pin. Um, they, they do fit a little bit snug, but then the pin will turn freely in the pills. And then as far as the front arm shimming, the kit says to use a one mil spacer, depending on how tight you tighten down the A and B block, you may need to adjust that to a 0.9 shim, especially when everything's new, but we're gonna go ahead and start with what the manual says, which is the one mil. Go ahead, put the B block in, and then tighten these screws down. So you can see right arm moves nice and free. Left arm is just a little bit snug. So sometimes you can just take with the A block and just barely crack those screws loose. And then you can see both arms are now free. So next step will be to put the front sway bar mount onto the gearbox and then we will also install the front sway bar and um, front sway bar links so 
Again, pretty straightforward. I'll go ahead and speed this up a little bit. Um, and if I get to a point where um, I come across something that's a, a key point or something critical, um, I'll slow it down and talk about that a little bit. Okay, so we're finishing up bag C, but I want to talk about setting the sway bars. You want to make sure that the sway bars, uh, for one, are equal from side to side, but you also want to make sure that there's not too much resistance. You want to make sure that the sway bar is able to move free. So what I'll do is I'll start by tightening down the right side to where there's just a little bit too much resistance and the sway bar doesn't move free. So with the sway bar kind of in the up position, I'll slowly start to loosen that set screw until eventually the sway bar drops and now it moves nice and free. So now I'll move to the other side. Again, tighten it down to where it has too much resistance. Slowly back that set screw until the sway bar drops. Now I'll take the sway bar and then just kind of check the side to side play. And as you can see, it moves just a little bit. You want to make sure that this moves free, um, especially if any dust gets in there. You don't want to have the sway bars bound up or it's going to bind up the suspension. Now new for the, the 8R Eco, we have um, these collars to be able to reduce the play in the sway bars. You don't have to use these, um, but it's, it's kind of a nice feature just to take out any additional um, end play in the sway bars. And with that, you'll basically make sure that the sway bar is centered, slide it over, to where it's just starting to touch the gearbox. But then again, you still want to make sure that everything moves nice and free. Once it does, you can go ahead and crank those down. That way they don't end up shifting or moving. And always check to make sure that they move free. We also made a change to the sway bars to where they don't use the little tags anymore. And it's now laser etched uh, with the sway bar size. So in the kit, this is a 2.3. And then you will go ahead and install the sway bar into the ends. It's, it's off, often um, kind of overlooked, or I see it a lot of times when guys build a new car, they will have these um, these collars where the sway bar is secured, or I'm sorry, where the sway bar end is secured to the sway bar, flipped. You wanna make sure that this has the proper orientation. Otherwise, as the suspension goes through the travel, it'll bind up the sway bar. So just make sure you pay close attention to the manual and install those in the proper orientation. And then, Another setting with the sway bars is <clears throat> you want to make sure that the amount of exposed sway bar that's sticking through the collar is equal from right to left. That way, when it's sitting flat on the table, the sway bar should pick up at the same time from both the right side and the left side. And as you can see, everything moves nice and free. And that will complete bag C. And we will now move on to bag D. So here we have bag D. This is going to be completing um, basically the front, front end assembly. Uh, we already did the lower front arm. So now we're going to do the front uprights and pillow balls. So we'll go ahead and start to install the pillow balls. And when you go to put the nut that secures the pillow ball, you'll always wanna kinda go backwards to start. 
and that will allow the nut to fall into the threads because it's a really coarse thread going into the front upright. And you'll want to over tighten it a little bit to where the pillow ball has some resistance. Slowly back it off till the pillow ball drops. And then you'll see the pillow ball has very, very little play, but is really free. And then you'll go ahead and just repeat that process for the remaining three pillow balls that go into the uprights. Go to the left, make sure you'll, sometimes you'll actually like hear the nut kind of fall into the threads, almost make like a little clicking sound. Back that off. This one's got a little, tighten it down again, try that again. So the pill ball stuck at the top, back it down until it drops. Check and make sure that there's just a little bit of play. And then we'll go ahead and do the other side. Now, after time, you can get a little bit of dust in, um, in the front uprights <clears throat> and it'll kind of bind up the pillow ball a little bit. So I've done a video on it. There's a little trick where you can take a number two pencil or you can take like some graphite dry lube. I like using the number two pencil trick um, because it'll kind of um, help clean the surface, knock off any dirt that's like embedded into the upright or the little plastic spacer. And then, um, but I'll show you where, where you want to use the number two pencil um, to kind of clean up the upright and that spacer. Pillow ball drops, everything moves nice and free. So there's a little bit too much slop there. So I'm going to tighten that down just a little bit. Pillow ball still moves free. Just a touch of end play. And then we'll do the final one. So where you'll want to take the number two pencil will be all on this surface that basically captures the pillow ball. And then also inside the upright where the pillow ball touches the upright. So you'll want to take a number two pencil and just kind of um, scribble around, make sure that you kind of apply an even amount of graphite from the number two pencil, and that'll work as a dry lubricant for the pillow balls. Now we'll go ahead <clears throat> and install the CVAs into the uprights. We also have optional universals that are very popular. The universals tend to work a little bit better when it's a, when it's a bumpy track condition. The CVAs that come stock in the kit seem to work best uh, when you're trying to generate the most amount of grip. So that's why we have the CVAs come in the kit and the universals are an option part. I like to put a little bit of thread lock to um, make sure that that doesn't come loose. That way when you're changing tires, that set screw doesn't come loose and the pin doesn't fall out, which can cause the wheel hex to fall off. So you don't need much, but just a little bit of thread lock helps secure that. Now we're going to put the pillow ball into the upper front arm. Make sure that the arms are marked on the bottom side, right and left. Tighten that all the way down. Do the same on the other side. 
So normally we, we use the one mil washer on the upper and lower front arm. Some kind of, sometimes guys will um, put their car on a setup station and drive themselves a little crazy trying to get the camber perfect. But you gotta understand, there's so many moving parts with the front of, of the car that if your steering is off just a little bit or your toe is off a little bit from one side to the other, it's gonna make the camber seem a little different. Um, basically, you can just go ahead, run one washer for the lower and one washer, one millimeter washer for the upper arm if you're in the middle position. If you do shorten the upper front arm or lengthen the upper front arm, you may want to adjust the washers uh, for the upper arm only. Now you don't want to over tighten the lower arm. Um, it obviously does need to be tight to where the washer bottoms out, but it doesn't need to be, uh, you know, over, over cranked down. Now we will assemble the upper front arm. Now there's four millimeters of adjustment for the upper front arm. So I like to use a two millimeter washer or two millimeter clip and then two one millimeter clips. And then those can be used later as a tuning option if you want to adjust the amount of caster you're running on the front of the car. But the default or what we normally run would be two millimeters um, in front and two millimeters in back. So before putting the upper uh, front front plate, just make sure that both of the drive shafts are into the outdrive cups. Um, with this upper front arm mount, I also like to use a little bit of thread lock. That's not a part that you like ever really take off the car, so you want to apply a bit of thread lock to make sure that that's nice and secure. And then go ahead and secure the top deck to uh, the front gearbox. So now we are through bag D. As you can see, everything uh, with the front end is, is basically coming together. Everything is nice and free uh, without any um, really dremeling filing. The only thing uh, that I did dremel was just a little bit of the flashing on the inner front arm, which if you are really careful with your flush cutters, you wouldn't need to really dremel that, but I just do it just to be on the safe side. And now we will move on to bag E. So bag E is gonna be pretty much the same steps that we did earlier, uh, just now for the rear of the car. Um, it's basically just installing the rear shock tower, rear diff, and it's, again, pretty much all the same steps that we already went through um, on the front of the car. So I'm going to go ahead, put thread lock on the set screw, run the set screw in so that we get some threads or get some thread lock onto the threads of the coupler. Run that all the way down, wipe off the excess thread lock, and then tighten that down super tight. Make sure, again, you can see there's just that little bit of end play. We're gonna drop the rear diff into the car. Everything moves nice and free. 
snap the rear cap on. Put the D block onto the gearbox and the stock pill orientation for the D block will be middle and down. Now we'll put the shock tower on. Now with the Rear body post, there's a rubber grommet that goes in here. That doesn't need to be cranked down. The screw head just needs to be touching the grommet because you want there to be this little bit of play. What that's gonna do is allow, when the chassis flexes, it's gonna help the body hold up a lot better. So the body post is gonna absorb some of that impact instead of uh, having all that force go through the body and breaking the body. And like I mentioned earlier, with these lower two screws that hold the shock tower onto the gearbox, it's not a bad idea to run longer screws and then put a nut on both sides of the gearbox. It's just gonna allow more support for the shock tower it's even more critical on the rear of the car because with the wing and the wing mount, when you crash and tumble, uh, the rear tends to take uh, or see more of the impact. So bag E is complete. We'll move on to bag F. And just like with bag E, bag F is going to be um, installing lower rear arms. And it's going to be very similar to the steps that we did earlier to the front of the car. So we'll go ahead and move on to bag F. So bag F, I went ahead and kind of cheated a little bit, started to assemble a few of the things. Again, a lot of these steps are the same that we did to the front end. So I'm gonna go ahead, install the rear sway bar. Kit comes with a 2.7 rear sway bar. Like I mentioned before, um, sway bars now have the laser etching with the size instead of the little tags. So kind of a neat feature for the 8R. We're going to go ahead, tighten down the set screw until there's a bit of resistance on the sway bar. Back off the sway bar until it drops. Do the same thing on the other side. it drops. Make sure that there's just a little bit of end play. I'm going to back those off just a tiny bit more. Now we will put the new collars on. That are It's going to reduce the end play with the sway bar. And then the final step in bag F is going to be to put the arms and um, C block on. So again, you wanna make sure the sway bar moves nice and free before you tighten down these little collars. So there's just a little bit of back and forth, but really zero or very little um, side to side play. With the rear arms, same thing, no reaming, no drilling of the hinge pins. You want the arm to be a little bit snug into the arm, and then the hinge pin will rotate inside of the pills. The pills for the C block in the kit, it's gonna be um, the inside middle location. So this is gonna give us a total of 2.75 degrees of toe in. Tighten 
both of those down. As you can see, the arms are nice and free. Make sure that you have the proper orientation with the collars on the sway bar, just like what I mentioned in the front. You wanna make sure that the set screw is towards the inside of the car. And then you will wanna make sure, again, that the amount of exposed sway bar is equal from left to right. So normally in the front of the car, we'll have like one to two millimeters of exposed sway bar. And then in the back of the car, usually we will run the collars to where they're flush with the end of the sway bar. So that's completion of bag F. We'll now move on to bag G, uh, which is gonna be rear hub, rear drive shaft, and upper rear arm for the MBX-8R Eco. So like I mentioned, bag G is gonna be rear hub, drive shaft, and upper front arm assembly. I went ahead just to speed it up a little bit and built the camber link ends and did a portion of the rear hubs. Um, with the rear camber links, we are gonna be inside on the shock tower and then the middle for the height. But when installing the screws into the inner uh, camber link balls, first you're going to want to make sure that you clean the screws with some brake cleaner. Make sure that there's no oil on the screws. And then put thread lock on the screw and also into the threads um, on, the, on the ball for the inner camber link. And you'll want to go ahead, crank those down, do the same thing on the other side. And then uh, one other thing just to touch on the rear chassis brace. It comes with uh, plastic inserts and also a rubber grommet. In most conditions, we run the plastic inserts. I actually like to glue these plastic inserts in because sometimes when you take the car apart, when you're cleaning stuff, um, you can lose one of those little inserts. So it's because I pretty much always run the inserts and don't run the grommet, I just go ahead and glue those inserts into place. I didn't do that here just because it's going to be a, a photo car, but just want to share that with you guys, what I do with my, my personal car. And then with this center chassis brace, I'll tighten it down to where it's snug, and then I'll back it off like a half to three quarters of a turn. That way this brace can still move. <clears throat> and now we will move on to the new rear hub carriers. So few things to make sure you pay attention to. With the rear hub carriers, they have these new carbon fiber plates. In the kit, it comes with plates that have three notches, and that's because these upper camber link holes are three millimeters taller than the E2131 stock rear hub that came on the MBX-8. So you can run those where the notches are either towards the inside or the outside. And what it's gonna do is if the notches are towards the outside, that's gonna be the stock length um, that we've used in the past for like the normal MBX-8. But if you flip them, you're now gonna be able to have half holes in between these current holes. So if you flip it over, it shifts all the holes a half a hole shorter 
if you're running um, the notch towards the inside. And with the rear hubs, there's just a lot of tuning options. So you can, you can kind of, you know, adjust and play with, with all the different options for yourself. I also have some videos planned um, that are going to explain a little bit of the differences between when you would want to run the standard or the zero plates or the three dot plates that come in the kit. But like I said, in the kit comes with a three dot. So we're going to build it the way that the kit comes. So for the spacing for the hub in the kit, it's going to be the middle position. So we're going to use the small spacer, the middle spacer in the front, and then we'll use the larger or thick spacer on the back side of the hub. Now with these outer rear hinge pins, they're a really, really hard material. So very, very rarely will you ever see one of these pins bend, but you do need to be careful when securing the nut that you don't over tighten it. You literally just need to tighten it down till it's snug. Um, if you've taken the nut on and off, a number of times you can maybe use just a little drop of, of blue thread lock um, but when everything's new you don't really need to use thread lock since it is a lock washer also with the rear hub you can adjust the spacing of this camber link front to back in the kit it um, uses both spacers on the back side um, if you need a little bit more support on the rear of the car you can shift to where that camera link position is uh, in the middle so you would run a three millimeter spacer in the front and a three millimeter spacer in the back <clears throat> now we'll just go ahead and do the same thing um, the other side of the car. Again, the, the kit comes with CVAs in the rear also. Um, the universals are um, an option part. It's something that you've maybe seen on a bunch of setup sheets recently from Ryan and myself. The majority of the big races that we go to, the tracks end up getting really rough and kind of blown out and the universals seem to be a little bit more consistent in those conditions. The stock CVAs are going to give a little bit more um, forward drive or grip, um, but it just depends on the conditions you're running in. That's why we have options for both CVA and Universal. Again, rear hub spacing is going to be middle, so we'll use a thin and medium spacer on the front side of the hub and then we will use the thicker spacer on the back side of the hub. You want to make sure that you put the drive shaft into the outdrive cup before then putting the upper um, upper rear arm into the upright otherwise you'll have to take some take some parts um, back off to be able to to get the drive shaft back in.
So we'll secure the upper camera link. And then now the lower outer hinge pin. Again, just want to make sure you don't over tighten this because sometimes you can break the threads off the, the lower hinge pin. So just like the front end, rear end is super free. You know, like you saw, nothing was reamed or dremeled, um, needed to be trimmed um, and everything nice and free. And now we are done with bag G. We'll move on to the next step and uh, starting to come together now. Okay, so here we have bag H. This is going to be um, servo saver and steering links. So just finishing up kind of the front clip of the car. So with the servo saver, I like to use a little bit of thread lock <clears throat> on the servo saver tube. Even though we have the clamping servo saver nut, it's just an extra safety feature to go ahead and put a little bit of thread lock on there. And then I'll also use thread lock on the screw for the clamping servo saver nut. I also like to run the servo saver a little bit tighter than what's recommended in the box. Normally I'll, I'll have um, four millimeters of exposed threads for the servo saver. And then I went ahead and already cleaned the bushings here and then also the screws that go through the steering plate into the bushings. You'll wanna, just like with the rear camera links <clears throat> and also with the steering links, I like to put a little bit of thread lock into uh, the steering bushings and then also onto the threads of the screws. Um, it's not really something that you take apart too often, but I see it a lot of times on guys with new cars where they have, have this come apart. So you wanna make sure you have a fair bit of thread lock down in the threads before tightening all this together. I did the same thing on the other side. And I don't know if maybe you watched the nitro build, but you can take a clutch shim, a 0.2 millimeter clutch shim, slide it over that and it'll work as like a thrust washer between the steering Ackerman plate and the servo saver. Um, and then on the other side, just the, the kind of bell crank side. Um, otherwise, the plastic, it has a fair bit of glass in it and it'll kind of wear into the steering rack. Um, and then can make the steering have a little bit of slop. So um, now with the thread lock, like I said, it's important that you get this thread lock together good, but you also need to make sure not to have too much thread lock because if you have too much thread lock and it gets between this bushing and the plastic, um, it can kind of bind that up a little bit. So you want to make sure that you don't, uh, you don't get thread lock there. So I had a set screw that actually fell down into this tube and that's what was making this screw bottom out. But that's all good to go now. And then we'll go ahead, put on the steering ends. And 
Again, I'm going to put a little bit of thread lock down into each of these steering balls onto the threads. And then I will also put a little bit of thread lock onto the threads of each screw. With the Ackerman plate, we're going to go in the middle position. That's what comes stock in the kit. If you want the steering to be less aggressive going into the turn, you would move back on the steering rack. And if you want it to be more aggressive going into the turn, less aggressive on exit, you would then move it forward. So middle is a pretty good safe starting point. Um, a lot of times we do run the Ackerman back one position from the middle. Just makes the steering a little bit smoother and carries a little bit more rotation through the middle and exit of the turn. But that'll just depend on your driving style and also the conditions that you're running in. and put the bearings in. And then we'll start putting all this together. Like I said, we have front clip, rear clip, um, center diffs ready to go, center diff mount. And uh, we'll start putting this together, put side guards onto the chassis and start bolting that all together before moving on to doing the shocks. So the MBX-8R Eco has a new chassis. Um, that's mainly because of the new battery tray. And uh, you'll see here in a little bit as this all goes together. And we put the battery tray onto the chassis. Um, but also some other really cool features with the new chassis. We have... Um, the ability to run a little bit more droop both on the front and the rear. The chassis has chamfers uh, to allow a little bit more droop, which is nice. And it's going to start coming together and looking a lot more like a complete car. Now with the front of the car, the kit comes with two different chassis braces, a short and a long. We normally run the short chassis brace. Just works a little bit better <clears throat> in the rough conditions. The um, longer chassis brace is going to give a little bit more steering. So it's just a nice tuning option. Again, both of them come in the kits. I go ahead and put the steering posts in. You want to use just a little bit of thread lock for the steering posts. Steering posts key into the chassis so they don't spin. But you do want to make sure that when you're putting the steering posts in that it's actually lined up to where it does key into the chassis. That way the post sits. Um, flat on the chassis. Then you can go ahead, drop the servo saver and steering assembly down. Make sure that the bearings stay in place and go ahead and install the front clip. So with the screws that go through this upper top plate into the steering post, you're also going to want to use a little bit of thread lock. Pretty much anywhere where you have the steel screw going into anything metal or aluminum, you're going to want to make sure you use a little bit of thread lock. I'm using blue for this build. Normally I use a 50-50 mix of blue and red, which ends up becoming purple. 
just because it has a little bit more hold strength than blue uh, with being a nitro racer in the long finals you want to make sure everything stays secure and doesn't doesn't come apart in those long races but for electric blue should be sufficient um, for pretty much all of the the metal parts with the steering links I pre-assembled those <clears throat> before starting um, starting to record and what what I like to do is I believe the manual it says 28.8 or 29.0 millimeters I like to run a little bit more toe out than that so I'm going to start at 28.5 for the steering ends and then the camera link in the back if you're running the three notches towards the outside you'll want to make that 28 millimeters or if you build it the way that the book says um, you'll just go off the measurement that um, that we tell you to do in the book as far as um, the ring and pinion goes you'll want to use a little bit of white grease I use a Protec white grease or you can use the uh, joint grease that comes in the kit and you'll basically just put a little bit of grease on the gears and rotate the drivetrain just so you have a nice thin coat of grease on the ring and pinion before securing that down to the chassis Now I've done a video on gearbox modification where you can actually run longer screws to secure the gearbox to the chassis. Um, the stock screws are four by 15 and then four by 20. But you can actually take a drill bit and drill through the gearbox and through the gearbox cover and run a 4x20 and 4x25 screw. It does add a little bit of weight, but it just allows more thread engagement so you don't strip out the, the gearbox. So it's starting to come together now, as you can see. <clears throat> Go ahead and we'll put the aluminum motor mount. Same thing, because you have a steel screw going into aluminum. We're gonna put just a little bit of thread lock. And then on the front side where it uses the plastic mount, you will not need uh, to use the thread lock.
So before putting the center diff in, I'm going to go ahead and put the center dog bones into place. And then you'll want to put those into the center diff before snapping the center diff down. We did also change the center diff cover on the MBX-8R Eco. It's just to make it look a little bit nicer and it's kind of vented that way if any like dust or little pebbles get in there, um, they're able to escape a little bit easier. And then with the larger nuts that go um, into the chassis braces, I like to go ahead, put those in, and then I'll put just a drop of glue. <clears throat> that way, when you go to tighten these down, um, it reduces the chance of that nut spinning in the chassis brace. Um, just a little tip that I do. Um, and then from there, we will move on. I'll go ahead and put the chassis braces on, and then we'll move on to the next step. So here we have the new battery tray that I'm getting ready to secure to the chassis. With the new battery tray, it comes with two different battery straps, a 380 millimeter and a 455 millimeter strap. And you will use the shorter strap if you're using a 4S shorty battery. And then the longer strap will be used if you're using um, the larger um, like 4S low profile or 4S um, standard big battery. Now with the tray, it you'll use the same tray for any of the 4S battery configurations. Obviously the strap will change like I just mentioned. Um, but the, the back part of the tray <clears throat> has multiple mounting positions on the chassis. So if you're using the bigger battery, this back half of the tray is gonna shift back. And then obviously you use the longer, longer strap to go with that. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and because I like, or I normally use the 4S shorty configuration, I'm gonna move the tray forward and um, go ahead and secure all this to the chassis. And we'll show you how this all goes together here in a minute. So there we have the front half of the tray. Now the back half, I'm gonna go ahead and line up. Now you wanna make sure you go ahead and put the battery strap through the tray before securing it to the chassis. So what's really nice with this is the battery still doesn't sit flat on the chassis. I know with some of the other cars, the battery sits flat on the chassis. Yes, it is a little bit lower center of gravity, but it's also much, much harder on the battery and the ESC. So we have the new tray that will secure and hold the battery an ESC in place and also help 
absorb some of the, the shock from the hard landings um, on some of the bigger jumps. So it's, it's going to be <clears throat> much safer and uh, just easier on your electronics than some of the other cars out there. So battery here in the front, ESC, and then now we will install the servo tray, servo and receiver tray. So this is the same um, from the MBX-8. And then it also has a personal transponder mount, which um, I like to try to put the personal transponder in the box. Um, it can be pretty tight, but it's just a lot cleaner if you're able to mount, mount it into the box. And then another thing that I like to do is for the servo screws, that go through the servo, they go into these plastic pieces. I like to go ahead and just glue those in place. That way, if you do ever have to take the servo out, these stay in place, they don't fall out. But just a little tip, it's not, not something that you need to do. You can do it without out gluing them in place. Just a little option. So we'll go ahead and button up some of this and continue on with the build, but we're getting close. So we have the new wing mount assembly. We're gonna mount the wing one up from all the way down. And then as you can see here with the new wing mount, it has a bolt on uh, plastic piece to provide a little bit more downforce. We also have a carbon fiber optional plate that can be used there. If it's a really windy condition, I would recommend taking that off to allow a little bit more airflow to get through the wing mount. <clears throat> but if you're looking for a little bit extra downforce, it's nice to have um, that plate installed into the wing mount. So we'll secure those down. And then we also have a new lightweight high downforce wing. On the bottom here, you can see there are four mounting locations. So you'll just go ahead, pick the desired mounting location. You can use a body reamer or use a three millimeter drill bit to poke through. And then we also have new aluminum wing buttons that come stock in the kit.
so of the wing position, if you need a little bit more rear end stability or just overall grip, you would want to shift the wing back. If you're looking for a little bit more mid corner rotation or overall steering, you would shift the wing forward. And again, on the bottom side of the wing, it has dimples for four mounting locations for the stock MBX-8R Eco Wing. Something else I want to show you on the chassis for the MBX-8R Eco, we have mounting locations in the back and also in the front of the chassis to where you can add weights. We make a 20 and a 40 gram optional weight so that you can kind of tune the weight distribution of the car. With the 4S Shorty battery moving so much weight forward, a lot of times we do run the 20 gram weight in the back as kind of our standard setting. Okay, so now we have the shocks. I went ahead and kind of partially assembled them just to make it a little bit more efficient. So just like with the outer rear hinge pins, when putting the piston onto the shock shaft, you're gonna wanna make sure not to over tighten the nut uh, that holds the piston in place. So you're gonna to wanna to tighten that down to where it, it has just a little bit of tension or preload on the piston, but to where you can still rotate the piston with just a small amount of resistance. Also, um, this lower nut that captures the seal pack, I like to put a little bit of thread lock on that just so it doesn't back off over time. Go ahead and put a little bit of shock oil down in the O-rings and then also a little bit on the shock shaft before putting it through the O-rings and also before tightening that lower nut down. Now Depending on the rear shock position you're running, sometimes it can be difficult to get the proper ride height. Sometimes the ride height will be higher in the rear than what, what you want. And it's a really, really simple fix. So if you're running outside hole in the rear arm and you're running the hub up, the, the way that the shock ends and everything are um, just stock in the kit will work just fine. But if you run inside hole in the rear arm and um, have the hub drop down, it's going to be really difficult to get the ride height um, in that like 26 to 27 millimeter range, which is where we normally run it. So that can easily be fixed by cutting the lower shock end. So all you need to do is cut two to three millimeters off this lower shock end. And what that will do is it will allow this spring cup to sit two or three millimeters lower, which is then gonna give you two to three millimeters more adjustment at the top. So I have a separate video on cutting the shock ends to be able to get, get the proper ride height if you need a little bit more information, um, but just wanted to touch on that briefly uh, during the build. So the shock caps are the new emulsion style shock caps, but the kit comes with both the emulsion O-rings and also the bladders. So a lot of tuning options with the MBX-8R Eco. Um, if you prefer bladders, kit comes with bladders. If you wanna run emulsion, uh, we have the O-rings to also run emulsion. So I'm gonna go ahead and finish building these shocks. I'm just, again, building them with the kit setup, the 8x1.3 uh, 
pistons with 550 oil front and rear and uh, we'll go ahead and finish that up and mount the shocks onto the car. So here it is, the completed MBX 8R Eco Buggy. Everything went together super nice, just like you would expect from Mugensiki. Um, I went ahead, finished, put the shocks on. Another really cool feature uh, with the shocks is the springs. We no longer use the little tags. Uh, the springs are actually uh, laser etched. They have the length and also the number of coils. If for some reason you have old springs where the tags fell off or any of the new springs and this marking wears off, you can count the coils. I have a video on that. But overall, really, really excited about the MBX-8R Eco build. Drivetrain is nice and free. Suspension is nice and free. And I'm really looking forward to doing future videos with my personal MBX-8R Eco. So look for those in the near future. And we will see you at the races.